A servant was in debt to his king for the amount of 10,000 talents. Hearing the servant's plea for patience and mercy, the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and forgave the debt. But then that same servant would not forgive a fellow servant who owed him 100 pence. On hearing this, the king lamented to the one he had forgiven, Shouldst not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? Now, there's some little difference of opinion among scholars regarding the monetary values mentioned here, and forgive the U.S. monetary reference. But to make the math easy, if the smaller unforgiven 100 pence debt were, say, $100 in current times, then the 10,000 talent debt, so freely forgiven, would have approached $1 billion or more. As a personal debt, that is an astronomical number, totally beyond our comp comprehension. Nobody can shop that much. <laughs> For the purposes of this parable, it is supposed to be incomprehensible. It is supposed to be beyond our ability to grasp, to say nothing of beyond our ability to repay. That is because this isn't a story about two servants arguing in the New Testament. It's a story about us, the fallen human family, mortal debtors, transgressors, and prisoners all. Every one of us is a debtor, and the verdict was imprisonment for every one of us. And there we would have all remained were it not for the grace of a king who sets us free because he loves us and is moved with compassion toward us. Jesus uses an unfathomable measurement here because his atonement is as an unfathomable gift given at an incomprehensible cost. That, it seems to me, is at least part of the meaning behind Jesus' charge to be perfect. We may not be able to demonstrate yet the 10,000 talent perfection the Father and the Son have achieved. But it is not too much for them to ask us that we be a little more godlike in little things, that we speak and act and love and forgive and repent and improve, at least at a hundred pence level of perfection, which it is clearly within our ability to do. My brothers and sisters, Except for Jesus, there have been no flawless performances on this earthly journey we're pursuing. So while in mortality, let's strive for steady improvement without obsessing over what behavioral scientists might call toxic perfectionism. We should avoid that latter excessive expectation of ourselves and of others and, I might add, of those who are called to serve in the church, which, for Latter-day Saints, means everyone, for we're all called to serve somewhere. In that regard, Leo Tolstoy wrote once of a priest who was criticized by one of his congregants for not living as resolutely as he should, the critic concluding that the principles the erring preacher taught must therefore also be erroneous. In response to that criticism, the priest says, look at my life now and compare it to my former life. You will see that I am trying to live the truth I proclaim. Unable to live up to the high ideals he taught, the priest admits he has failed. But he cries, attack me then, if you wish. I do this myself, but don't attack the path I follow. If I know the way home, 
but I'm walking along it drunkenly, is it any less the right way simply because I'm staggering from side to side? Do not gleefully shout, look at him. There he is crawling into a bog. No, don't gloat. Give your help to anyone trying to walk the road back to God. Brothers and sisters, every one of us aspires to a more Christ-like life than we often succeed in living. If we admit that honestly and are trying to improve, we're not hypocrites, we're human. May we refuse to let our own mortal follies and the inevitable shortcomings of even the best men and women around us to make us cynical about the truths of the gospel, the truthfulness of the church, our hope for the future, or the possibility of godliness. If we persevere, then somewhere in eternity, our refinement will be finished and complete, which is the New Testament meaning of perfection.